Greetings from Beacon Church. Um, it's again a wonderful uh, day after a week of uh, labor to come into the house of God to worship. Um, the character we look at uh, this morning is uh, someone mentioned in the list of heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, verses 36 to 37. This person is an episode of disobedience and stubbornness. His life, in fact, demonstrates God's ability to use negative circumstances to fulfill his uh, purpose. Let's glean what lessons uh, we can learn uh, from the story of Samson today. Uh, I did not, uh, in fact, uh, like the name Samson that I was given uh, because uh, most of uh, my friends teased me saying, hey Samson, where is Delilah? So I stuck up with the middle name Satish, but these days I use the word Samson name rather name Samson because I want to identify with uh, uh, a Bible character as well as uh, a Christian name a Hebrew name rather uh, it has a very good significance uh, we're going to learn five principles from the life of Samson I, I didn't want to mention uh, Samson there in my sermon title because I want to create a little bit of uh, anxiety in you to listen to uh, what I was going to come up with and as we look at uh, the history of Israel uh, the times when judges were ruling were very bleak days dark ages of children of Israel I would say uh, because people were doing whatever they thought was right in their eyes whatever was right in their eyes. If each of us begin to do whatever is right in our own eyes, then there's going to be a disaster. That's what was happening. And there was a cycle of uh, people doing wrong, and then they were committing sin, and then they supplicated to God, and uh, God saved them, and then there was kind of rest for some time. That's, what, that's the cycle you keep seeing as you go through the book of uh, Judges. And God, time to time, raised uh, uh, judges uh, to deliver children of Israel from the hands of uh, their enemies. God will take us into captivity. God will take us into troubles when we do wrong. Remember that. There are times God takes us through difficult times to test our faith. Uh, that's a different thing. but. Uh, we going into trouble when we do wrong is really a serious matter and we need to be always guarding ourselves from that kind of situation we should not get into trouble with god and uh, philistines uh, were uh, ruling children of israel they ruled for 40 years uh, and that was the time they did not have a judge and god was raising a judge and uh, Look at chapter 13, verse 1. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. What was evil in the sight of the Lord? We need to ask this question time to time. Are we doing evil in the sight of the Lord? This is the question we need to ask God and get right with God. Uh, because they did evil in the sight of the Lord, uh, the Lord gave them into the hand of Philistines for 40 years. During that time, there was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of Danites whose name was Manoah and his wife was barren and had no children. You know, we, we see in the Bible so many barren women uh, who had the blessings of God and then they delivered uh, a male child. And for example, we know the story of Samuel, isn't it? Because Sarah, Rachel, Samuel, okay, they were all barren. No, Samuel's mother, Hannah, were all barren and God visited them 
and then promise them to give them a child. Okay, and uh, that's what is happening to um, Manoa, that was Samson's uh, father, and then his mother. And uh, the Lord did appear and granted uh, uh, a, a child to them. And uh, if, if you look at verse uh, 7, look at verse 7. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, so then drink no wine. This is uh, for the mother, okay? Or uh, strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. I was so tempted to entitle my sermon as Um to Tomb. Um to Tomb. Uh, but uh, here we see that we are called to live a holy life uh, even even before we were born, God has chosen us for that. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, it said that we have been chosen to be holy, to be separated from the world. And, and Samson was to be separated from the womb itself for God, consecrated for God. How many of us really? Here is a very good uh, 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 parenting principle that God is laying. God is laying for us parents. All right, uh, I, I still remember uh, reading Bible to my son when my wife was carrying Jesse. All right, and I was reading Erickson. He didn't become a theologian. All right, a great theologian like Erickson. Okay, uh, but he loves the Lord, and he is faithful to the Lord, and that that's that's what matters the most. And uh, uh, parenting is is very important, and God is instructing. Uh, Samson's mother here that you should abstain from these things because your child is consecrated from the time you have conceived him right and consecration begins in our life as Christian parents from the time a child is conceived in fact and uh, Samson was to be raised as a Nazarite and as we read in chap chapter 13 of uh, Judges verse 5 For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, no razor shall come upon his head. If this is a Nazarite vow in the Old Testament, we, we don't come under that. We are not under the law today to have this kind of you know Nazarite uh, uh, vow to be taken. Uh, but this is under the law. You can see that in Numbers chapter 6, if you want a reference, where uh, the Nazarite uh, laws are given. And uh, it says here that. Uh, verse 5 for behold you shall conceive and bear a son no razor shall come upon his head for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines so, so he was he was brought into this world with a purpose and he had to consecrate his life from the time he was conceived in fact parents have to do that mother had to do that and son had to be taught to be consecrated all his life but this is so important that we take this seriously. When we sanctify ourselves, we are sanctified by God by the, at the time when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And every day we have to sanctify ourselves. That's called progressive sanctification. We don't become holy, holy in one day. All right. There's a, there's a growth in our life, in our spiritual life. As we, as we spiritually mature, we learn to be more holier and uh, we commit ourselves to God more and more. And uh, God, in fact, had set apart uh, Samson from the womb to the grave. In fact, uh, he was chosen before the foundation of the earth. Remember that? Uh, uh, we are all chosen before the foundation of the world. As we read in every chapter uh, 1 verse 4, uh, understand the purpose of God in choosing us. All right? We are chosen for salvation. We are chosen to be sanctified. Okay? We are chosen to serve him. Every Christian is called to serve, not just the pastor, every member of a church. Every Christian who is saved must involve in the ministry. Uh, ask this question, am I separated unto God or am I separated from God unto the world? How much time I give to the world, how much time I give to the Lord? This is the question we need to all ask. 
and uh, make sure that we are giving our adequate time to God to keep ourselves away from the world. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 to 16, we read that Peter quoting that, Be ye holy as I am holy. As God is holy, as God is separated from sin, we need to be separated from the sin. You know, our life must be different from the others. Uh, Samson means uh, uh, sun rays. Okay? Uh, he, was, uh, he was sunny. He could be called sunny. At one point of time, I wanted people to call me sunny. All right? When I was a kid. Okay? Because the short, uh, the nickname for Samson is sunny. Uh, but most of my friends call me uh, Satish or Sam. That's in the college. They call me Sam. Sam is my brother's name, Samuel. That goes well with Samuel. Sam, Samuel. But for Samson, is sunny. And he, he had to be a light in the world. Remember that. But what happened to, what happened to Samson? Huh? He became blind. He had to see the darkness in his life at the end. Isn't it? So when we don't sanctify ourselves, that's what happens to all of us. Uh, we, we'll be blinded to the world. Or the Lord will be blinded towards us. In fact, that uh, we become, you know, darkness. We got to be careful. Uh, Christians are called to be separated from the world. World's way of life. Christian's life is a life of overcoming the world, but not a life of conforming to the world. It in fact demands holiness in our life. We are called to live a holy life, a consecrated life. This morning I would like to appeal to you to consecrate your life to God. Let your life be consecrated to God more than anything else in your life. Here's a, a principle that we get. As Christians, we have a higher calling than the pursuit of happiness. It is the pursuit of holiness. Happiness versus holiness. Which one is winning in our life? Happiness <coughs> or holiness? Okay. We want to be entertained all the time, isn't it? Even in the church, people want to be entertained. The church which entertains the most will have greater number. All right? It's called consumerism. You know, where the word of God faithfully preached, the people don't like to listen. You know, we want to sing more than listen to the word of God. But we don't understand the preaching of the word of God is part of the worship. All right? Jesus stood up and took a scroll and he read from the book of Isaiah and gave the scroll. And he said, this day, this is fulfilled. The word of God is part of our worship. However, the main point that we see here from the life of Samson is that we need to be consecrated to God. We consecrate our children from, from the time the child is conceived in a mother's womb and to God as Christians. That's what we do. Till our children go to the grave, they are consecrated unto God. I appeal to you to consecrate your life to God. The second thing that I would like to point out is uh, found in chapter 14. Chapter 14 verses uh, uh, verses 1 and 2. We should not be carnal in our choices. We should not be carnal in our choices. Samson was very very ungodly because he sought ungodly companionship. Look at chapter 14 verse uh, 1. He is not supposed to make himself unclean. The word of God was very clear that one should not unequally yoke with an unbeliever. And this is what uh, Samson is doing. Um, Samson went down to Timnah and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Get me. I love her. She looks good. And he says in, in, in verse 3, the last part, when, when, when parents object to that, you know, don't we have any good woman among ourselves? All right? There are so many pretty Jewish women. Why don't you marry one of them? People who hold to the same belief system. You're making a wrong choice. But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. They were doing whatever was right in their eyes. Remember, that is the time 
frame that Samson comes, he's supposed to judge people who are doing wrong in the sight of the Lord, but he himself was doing wrong because he was lusting after a woman who looked good to him. He was a very sensual person. Carnal choices get us into bad situations. Bad situations. But God can override those. How many bad choices that we have made in our life? Haven't we made bad choices? Haven't we? Don't be afraid. I have made. If pastor admits that he has made bad choices, it should not be hard for the people in the congregation to admit if they have made bad choices. Is that clear? I'm not saying, I'm not blaming you. Okay? Maybe you, are, you have made good choices all your life and that's good if you have done good choices in your life. But I made some bad choices. Okay? But God has overridden those choices and he has fulfilled his purpose. Okay. But this doesn't mean that you have to make bad choices so that God can override them. There is no license for that. Remember that. And we need to be careful when we make choices. Let not our flesh uh, guide us in making uh, choices that would uh, lead us to make choices that will be hurting God. Okay. Uh, however, God does use our circumstances uh, to fulfill His purpose. A uh, very, very fatal choice he makes. He desired to marry outside of his people, a woman in Timna. Okay, woman in Timna. Uh, God chose to intervene there and killed how many people? 30 people he killed. He puts up a riddle, all right? He's married to this woman and he puts up a riddle and the girl whom he is married to pesters him to give the answer otherwise she would face the wrath of the, his, her own people and they threaten her saying that we will come and uh, kill you and kill your father's house you know we are going to burn that was a life threatening situation for this woman she wants to save herself and her family and then she doesn't see the consequences as such uh, that would uh, make her lose uh, Samson as her husband and she kind of yields to the pressure, puts pressure on Samson, gets the answer for the riddle, you know the story, and uh, uh, Samson gets angry and goes back to his home. He doesn't consummate the marriage, and it, the girl's father gives his daughter to the best man. And Samson comes back to take her as his wife, he has not consummated, he wants to consummate the marriage and when he approaches the father, what happens? Hey, he has, she has been given to the best man. He gets really very, very, very mad. Look at verse 19 of chapter 14. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. God is using, though he had made a wrong choice, he was in a mess. God is still using that bad situation in Samson's life to wipe away God's enemies. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house and Samson's wife was given to his companion look at what happens in his life. That's not a good situation, isn't it? But how many Palestinians are really killed here? I'm saying Palestine. That's what is happening today. All right? Philistines are Palestinians. And then we notice in verse uh, chapter 15, chapter 15, and after some days, at the time of wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat and he said, I'll go into my father, wife in the chamber. But her father wouldn't allow him to go in. And her father said, I, will, I really thought that you utterly hated her. So I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? He doesn't have. But he is not like Jacob. Is that clear? Jacob got Leah and he got Rachel. He worked for Rachel. 
He had so much of love for her. So much of love for him. He works. But here, Samson doesn't compromise at all. He gets angry. He takes 300 jackals, okay? And he ties them tail to tail and sets torches and sets fire, makes these uh, jackals run into the standing uh, crops, right? Burns all their food. And also the olive is gone. The stacked grain and the standing grain all just burnt. And then he goes and hides in the rock of Etam and there Philistines come up against uh, the tribe of Judah and uh, 3,000 men of Judah goes, go to, go to uh, the cave where uh, Samson was uh, taking refuge and they negotiate. You know, we're not going to kill you. We're going to just tie you and we're going to hand, him, hand you over. Otherwise, they're going to fight with us. And Samson also doesn't want to fight with these people, with, with his own um, uh, uh, nationals, all right? And uh, so they, they, they tie him and uh, give him uh, or hand him, over to, hand him over to the Philistines. And then the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him. Look at the mess that Samson is in. Samson has done wrong, but still God is overriding. 30 people have been killed from the enemy camp and now 1,000 people will be killed. That's what we see here. You know, 3,000 from Judah, they come. But look at chapter 15, verse 14. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. The Spirit of the Lord rushed. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him and the ropes that were on his arms became as flags that has caught fire it's a miracle of god and his bonds melted off his hands and he found a j fresh jawbone he's touching a dead animal all right he's not supposed to touch a dead animal all right and uh, so this is this is not good and he, he has already violated uh, before i will talk about it and uh, uh fre flesh fresh jawbone of donkey and put out his hand and took it and with it he struck thousand men. Thousand men. Alright. But before that we see that when he goes to meet this girl in Timna, he comes across, he walks through the vineyard. That's not the place he should be. He should be away from Hawaii. Okay. But I, some commentators say he shouldn't have been there. You know, if you are near wine shop, you are tempted to drink wine, right? Hmm? Alcohol. So stay away. But he's walking through the vineyard and he comes across a lion. He kills it. And then next time when he is walking through, he wants to have, look at what happened to the lion that he had torn. He was so strong. And uh, there was uh, a honey in it and he eats that honey. And he doesn't tell his parents that he has, uh, you know, violated uh, the consecration of the Nazarite law. Always tell your parents what you do. Is that clear? There's something that we need to learn from this. Always tell your parents what's happening in your life. Keep them posted. Samson was not doing that. Regarding his wife, he said, but he demanded, he was adamant, he was stubborn. I want this girl at any cost. And he gets into trouble. But as he's going to meet this girl, he messes up with his uh, consecration. He doesn't tell about it. When we do wrong, it's better to tell parents, they will help us, you know. However old you are, you, you tell your parents, just talk to, talk to them. When we grow up to be adults, so we want to take our own responsibility, but still parents can give you good advice. Is that clear? No, we should not be carnal in our choice. You know, all things work together for good to them that love God, okay. And uh, here we see that God's purpose for our lives is a way greater than our biggest mistakes. God can still work in our life even when we are failing God. But don't keep failing God. Is that clear? And the third one is we are free to choose, but our choices are not free from consequences. You know, God is 
God has not made us like puppets. We are not robots. We are not programmed. Huh? God has given us the freedom of choice. We can, we can choose what we want. But here, look at the choices that uh, Samson is making. He's going after a, a woman who is not, uh, who is not from his uh, faith. He's going to a woman who was an idol worshipper, a, a, a Philistine. They worshipped a, a Dagon, the god, god of the harvest, right? And uh, then we see in chapter 16, look at chapter 16, verse 1. Samson went to Geza, Aha. That's the issue today. From yesterday, that has been a huh? bone of contention, isn't it? From Ge Geza, the the rockets, the missiles are being launched from Hamas into Israel. The war is going on. I don't know how far this war is going to go, but we need to pray for peace in Israel. That's what the Bible says. Peace in Israel. And uh, so he saw a prostitute and he goes into her. He doesn't even marry her. All right. Uh, he's, he's just a moral person at this point of time. And uh, the, the people from that city all come there. Guys, it's all come and gather. They are waiting for the daylight to break so that they can take Samson and, uh, 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 you know, kill him. That's all they wanted to do. And But what does Samson do? Samson gets up in the midnight and walks away. And what does he do? Look at his strength. Samson lay till midnight and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and pulled them up, bar and uh, all and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. He escapes. How could he do that? Probably he was strong, but I believe that Samson was just like you and me, but he was strengthened by God. Is that clear? He had the strength of the Lord. There was a purpose in Samson's life. I'm, with all his mistakes, God was still using him. That sometimes I, 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 I have to examine my life. I, I, time to time I examine. I say, what is wrong with me, God? You know, why things are not happening? Exhibit your strength to my life. Make me a channel of blessing. Well, we see the strength of God working in his life. We'll never be able to choose the outcome of our choices. Remember this, right? He's making all wrong choices. But consequences will be there. Why should the enemies come, surround Geza, all right? To take his life. And then we notice in chapter 16, verse 4. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Because of this name, I hated my name, first name, Samson. Is that clear? Hey, Samson, where is Delilah? I used to be very bashful, very shy. Okay. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, seduce him. Look at him. He loved Delilah. Okay. He loved her very much. And the enemies were using this lady to seduce him. She would have been smart enough to understand that this lady is seducing him. It's going to lead to the downfall of him. She was seduced. Uh, she, she was forced to ask Samson where the strength lied. It was not in his arms, it was not in his body, but it was from the Lord that Samson did understand. He should have simply said, it is from the Lord. It is from the Lord. Many preachers don't know this. Many Christians do not know this. They think that just because they have the gift of gab and they have some PRO ability that they are able to muster people, Shouting and preaching is not the strength of the Lord. It's just emotional gimmick, I, feel, I believe. You just say a word, it should be powerful. 
whether you shout and tell or you don't shout and tell, you tell normally. So Samson and Samson and Delilah are playing one against the other here. She's seducing, pressing him hard to tell. He should have learnt a lesson from the first woman he had met, isn't it? She also pressed him for seven days. And here, three times, she says, you mock me, you don't love me. And then he keeps on telling lies. If you do this, you know, my strength is gone. Finally, finally. Look at verse 15, and she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times. Verse 16, and when she pressed him hard with her words, day after day, she pestered, nagged him, and urged him. He was, he was mentally tortured. Then he lets out the secret. A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's home. He knew that he was consecrated, but he was failing God constantly. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. It's a consecration that is needed in our life. A dedication to God, commitment to God. As, as, as the book of Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 tell us, you know, that I beseech you, my dear brethren, by the mercies of God, present to yourself, holy and acceptable unto God. So that's what we need to present ourselves, holy and acceptable to God. Which, which consecration Samson was just neglecting? Delilah understood that he had told the truth. And the Philistines come up against him when he is shaven off. What a tragedy that we see in the life of, uh, life of Samson. Look at the choice that he had made. And look at the consequence. Here is a consequence. What a pathetic, what a tragic, tragic, very, very tragic consequence in the life of Samson. Verse 20, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out at, as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. When the Lord leaves us, you know, in the sense, in the Old Testament it happened, you know, in our life, when the Lord stops operating in our life, when we quench the Holy Spirit, When we hurt the Holy Spirit and keep quenching Him, keeping Him in operating in our life, then God doesn't work in our life. Don't let, do not grieve the Holy Spirit and don't quench the Holy Spirit. Is that clear? Constantly don't keep hurting the Holy Spirit. He wants to work in our life. He wants to empower us. We keep hurting God. If we keep on hurting God, we are going to render the Holy Spirit inoperative in our life. That is called quenching the Holy Spirit. Don't make Him inoperative. As much as you surrender your life to God, that much God will take control of your life with the Holy Spirit and make you fruitful. The Lord left you. The Philistine seized him, gouged out his eyes. Two eyes were taken away. How painful it must have been, isn't it? Nah? Painful experience. Brought him down to Gaza, bound him with the bronze shackles, shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison, a slave he became. When you become slave to the flesh, this is what happens to you. You become slave to the slave master. 
that was not the end. He was asked to entertain people. All right, his hair had grown. He was blind. They were having a feast for their god Dagon. That's what we see in verse 23. And then all the lords of the Philistines were there in that temple where they had a feast for their god Dagon. And that's where we see that he having victory, no doubt. But look at the consequences. Make good choices in your life. Every action we make will either take us further or draw us closer to God. Here, Samson had gone away from the Lord. We are to choose a spouse within our faith. Remember this. Young people, they're not married still. All right? We should not make a foolish mistake. We have talked about uh, the woman from Timna, a harlot in Gezer, a Philistine woman named Delilah. Parents saw it foolish decision. And the consequences we see in, in Samson's life that he lost his wife, he lost his strength and sight. Look at the consequences. You may think that you can convert the person whom you marry, but no, that doesn't happen. One of my friends is going through that. He married a Hindu and he always used to tell me, Pastor Satish, you don't know I married a Hindu. My life is miserable. I have to clean up the house the day she has some puja in the house. He has to collect flowers. He's crying all his life because of that mistake, one mistake he made. One of our staff, a woman, said, I want to marry a rich man. It doesn't matter who he is. If he's alcoholic, it doesn't matter to me. A Bible college graduate who was working in our college, he thought, oh, this is not the right person to have in the Bible college as a matron for the girls. Huh? Matron for the girls saying that I will marry a person even if he is alcoholic, as long as he is rich, it, it's okay for me. Hmm? Don't choose a spouse out of your faith. Marry a person who holds to the same belief system. Okay? Marry a Christian. Don't marry an unbeliever. Do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, says Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 17. Very clear instruction. In the Old Testament, there is a clear instruction given to the children of Israel, and Samson should have been careful. He just ignored the word of God. He did not honor God and God's word. And in the New Testament, that is repeated again for us. Choosing a mate is so life-changing that it should not be based on your will, but God's will. God's will is God's word. First thing you should ask if you are interested in someone, is that clear? Are you born again? First question, are you born again? There are many Christian women who are not born again. They go to church. Is that clear? There are many Christian men who go to the church, they are religious, but they are not born again. Ask the question, if a person says, I'm a Christian, are you born again? A born again person must marry only a born again person. Fifth one, we need to use our strength for God's work. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Samson had supernatural strength. We all have the supernatural strength. Not a physical strength, but I tell you, we have the spiritual strength. Is that clear? We have been empowered by the Holy Spirit today as Christians. We are as strong as Samson was spiritually today. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's the reason Paul could say, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. If I'm doing something for the Lord, it's through His strength. Look at what uh, 
Samson did. He tore a lion in half. Like a goat is slain. You know, it was so easy for him. Try to fight with lion. <laughs> you, are, you, you and I are like sandwiches. Uh, no, not sandwiches. Sausages to lion, isn't it? But Samson had the strength from the Lord. Single-handedly kills a thousand people with a donkey's jawbone. He didn't have a AK-47. Huh? A jawbone. With that, he kills thousands. He carried two gates, gate posts on his shoulder. What a strength he must have. Those gates were all big ones, you know, you see in the movies. He brought down a massive pagan temple that killed 3,000 people. What did he do? You know, finally, he prays a final prayer of Samson is to glorify God. That, that's what we see in verse 30, the last part. Now, look, look at, look at, uh, 30. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and a house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. He, he was just fulfilling the purpose of God. Though he was wrong many times, he was fulfilling the purpose of God. Parents also did not know that God was using all his mistakes to destroy the enemies. You know, we, we, we have supernatural giftedness, empowerment. God has given us many skills, right? Has God given us skills? Huh? Many things that, that we can do for the Lord in the church. Today, the Lord is building the church. I will build my church. Some of you should have come and ask me, Pastor, what can I do for you? What can I do for the Lord through the church? I'll, I'll give you a task. Morning, one of you stand there and make sure that no vehicles are parked near so that we can pull up all our cars. Okay? Some of us have to park here or there, you know. One of you can do that service. I know you're playing music. You're setting up. And the church members can come and offer service to the church. When we all do together, the church will grow. As long as only pastor is doing, that's not good. The church will never grow. The church will never grow. We all have to put our hands together to do the work of the Lord. And Samson just, you know, he went to the main pillars. He sought the help of a little boy, a young man, and brought the building down. And he killed more people, enemies of God. At this point of time, then, in any time during his life. You know, here is the principle. It's our Christian duty to use our strength for the glory of God. Can, can we make a commitment to God that we will use all our knowledge and the strength and the abilities that we have for the glory of God? And we do it through the church because church is being built by Jesus. One of my friends put a video saying that a church has been converted into a temple. And the very next day, but Jesus said, I'll build my church. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. The church will never be wiped out from the face of the earth. Is that clear? Amen. The church, church will be raptured, not wiped away. The true church will be raptured. It's not very far. It's not very far. When we ignore our consecration, we make choices that result in consequences. Consequences are bad. Look at what happened to Samson. He lost his wife. What a shame, isn't it? What a shame. Losing a wife. If we lose a girlfriend, we, we feel bad. Losing a wife is still worse. Huh? Then we see here, he goes to a prostitute. What a, what a, what a filth he was. Huh? Then he falls in love with Delilah. Who are all heathens who worship the heathen gods? And they had no interest in Samson. Is that clear? They didn't love Samson. 
None of these women really love Samson. They love themselves. They love their own people. See how? They love their own people. Love their own gods. We should not compromise. We should draw the line and say, hey, we love our God. Must be like Ruth. Huh? Must be like Ruth. I will follow. Ruth was a Moabite. Moabite. Okay? And she tells Naomi, I'm going to follow your God and you. Esther says, if I perish, I perish. Look at the stand they take. Take stand for the Lord. Follow the Lord. Don't follow the footsteps of people like Samson and others. Maybe make our choices in line with God's word and see God using us. I'm telling you, today we may condemn Samson, isn't it? But we are not better than Samson in making wrong choices without a commitment to God. But remember, God will use the choices you make to fulfill his purposes. I don't want to deliberately do wrong for God to use that occasion to accomplish his purpose. Is that clear? I want to be as careful as possible. I want to be doing the will of God and God to accomplish his will through my life happily. Hmm? That's what I want God to do in my life. You make a choice. Choice of your own. God lets you do that. God also has taught us in the word that you have to make choice in line with the word of God. Sometimes we ask, what is God's will? Here is God's will. Okay? Clearly given. So, you can make your own choices, but you will never, 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 I said it three times for emphasis, escape the consequences. Consequences of that. If you do the will of God, the consequences are not fatal. May God help us to apply these lessons that we have learned from the life of Samson. God bless you. If you like the sermon, like it, subscribe, share it with others. Thank you. God bless.